Good morning, everybody. My name is Fiona Gilbertson, and I am founder of an organisation called Recovering Justice. Um, we look at the harms created by drug policy in the lives of people who use drugs. Um, I am here to chair this panel. I'm really excited by it. It's got a very wordy title, and I imagine it's around how drug users and sex workers come together um, to support each other um, against discriminatory policy. <laughs> and I'm going to introduce my the first speaker, who is Jake Jones. Jake is the Community Support Officer for Umbrella Lane, which is Scotland's largest sex worker charity. Um, we will put links to that uh, in the chat box, and I would advise everybody to check it out. He's responsible for the provision of support and all things community related. His lived experiences, it's his lived experience of homelessness, migration and sex work make him passionate about ensuring no member of society is excluded from a decent stigma free standard of living. Academically, he specializes in minority rights and in particular linguistic minorities. He's also a board member for Edinburgh Food Project, which was which is one of the largest networks of food banks in Scotland. He's an active, he is also active in European activism, managing the social media for one of Europe's oldest sex worker advocacy groups, and he is on the board for the European Sex Worker Rights. <laughs> European Sex Worker Rights. Oh God, my brain's not working which is the largest European network of peer-led sex worker organisations. Jake is also working with European AIDS treatment group to promote sexual health across Europe. And I will hand over to my hopefully more eloquent than me colleague, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous, thank you for the introduction. So I'll just share my screen. We tested it out, so it should work hopefully. Nice one. And this is a lengthy aforementioned title, <laughs> A Public Health and Decriminalization Approach to Sex Work and Drug Use, a discussion on solidarity and, solidarity and evidence. So the structure of this panel is sort of as follows. Myself and the two other speakers will have like a short mini presentation each covering a slightly different but interconnected theme. And then after that, we'll have the bulk of the session for questions and answers that you may have. So for the one second, first session uh, section, I thought it would be a good idea to sort of go to the basics of what sex work is and then also what Umbrella Lane is and what Umbrella Lane does, because I know there's a lot of misconceptions sort of around sex work. Um, so sort of looking at sex work in a very basic way, I thought it would be a good idea to look at the different views surrounding sex work. And I say modern views, but you can tell I like history because I start a little bit in the past. So these historical themes definitely have a strong impact on how sex work is viewed today and the different approaches people take to viewing sex work. So starting at sort of the advent of social care, it was very much religious and you see a lot of these themes repeat still today. So the key points here, it was really women in need of protection from themselves and from men. And it really challenged that existence of sexual freedom for women. And it really began to shift a little bit during the advent of more charitable organizations that were separate from religious groups. And during that period, there was a big shift to the victimhood narrative, which was linked with the anti-slavery movement at the time. And that really viewed women as incapable of making their own decisions, which is something that comes up a lot in sex worker narratives today as well. Um, so that changed once again in the early 1900s when the victimhood approach changed to a public enemy approach because sex workers during particularly the World War I period were seen as negatively impacting the country's troops capacity by making soldiers ill through disease. So they took a really negative approach to sex work and sex workers. 
it did change sort of again back to that rehabilitation and rescue when social work began to professionalize a little bit and this really continues up until today where a lot of organizations and individuals particularly those supportive of the nordic model take a very strong victim-based approach um and that sort of also tries to blame women for having certain personalities or conditions that might make them more prone to sex work. Um, so from 1990s onwards, as I said, it sort of really did continue into that victims of violence and exploitation. And this period sort of brought in economic factors to that as well, um, rather than just social or mental factors. And that was really linked as well with the um, prevalence and more knowledge about sexual health conditions. So as those became more researched and more talked about in the public sphere, sex work became further demonized as perpetrating that. There is an alternate theory that developed sort of at the same time from the 1980s onwards that looks more at sex work as a legitimate means of work, one that where sex workers deserve to have their human rights respected as individuals and then their labor rights respected as well. And this really enshrines the woman's freedom of choice. So at this point in time, there's really two different, two main different camps in terms of feminism, radical and liberal feminism. So radical feminism would be saying there is no way that a woman can willingly enter sex work. And that has big implications for consent, which will come up later in the presentation. Whereas liberal feminism takes the approach that it's a woman's right and within their capacity to decide what they do with their bodies as well. So shifting away from the different views of sex work, I wanted to touch a bit on sex worker advocacy in general, because I think that's really important to understanding where sex work is today. So it really began in the 1980s with the advent of the minority rights movement, which was the fifth wave of human rights. And you see sex workers, sex worker advocates very strongly involved in different minority rights movements, be it women's liberation, labor rights, and LGBT rights. So sort of during the 90s with the advent of social media and greater interconnectivity globally, and also through individuals, You've seen a lot of networks and organizations form that are peer led to advance the rights of sex workers, beginning with the global network since 1992, which encapsulates sort of peer led organizations across the entire world. And then also um, a big moment was sort of in 2001 when there was a big sex worker protest in Venice. And since then, the red umbrella, which you might have seen when sex workers talk about sex work has been very linked with sex worker advocacy as a symbol. It's interesting because originally I always thought the symbol was much older, but it's actually fairly recent. Um, I think another key thing to point out here would be the role of protest. Um, so I already mentioned sex workers have been very active in other protest movements, but we've also sort of done a lot ourselves. And a lot of our key dates um, come from protests. So the largest sex work protest in the history of the world um, happened in Calcutta, and that is enshrined as International Sex Workers' Rights Day, a slightly less rights-focused day and more of one of celebration came when sex workers occupied a church in Lyon. Um, and then finally, the most recent one, International Data and Violence Against Sex Workers, which is a fairly lengthy name for a day, but probably the most important one came following a string of murders that happened in Salt Lake City. So you can sort of see the role of protest in sex worker advocacy because oftentimes sex workers are denied the chance to speak in other forums or engage with policy planners because they're actively excluded, which makes the role of protest very, very key. Um, I wanted also to talk briefly about harm reduction in relation to sex work. Um, so one of the key things Umbrella Lane does is support a public health based approach, which differs very strongly from a justice based approach. 
And with that, it's about creating safe spaces for individuals and communities. And this is going to come up later in the presentation. That's why I'm sort of skimming through this section. So I won't take too long on this slide. Um, so with harm reduction, really, it's about making sure that sex workers and other marginalized and vulnerable groups feel safe and comfortable accessing the services that they need. Um, and in order to do that, you really need to have a peer-led approach and involve sex workers, um, which is the next slide. And just very briefly again, because it will come up later in the presentation, um, looking at the value of lived experience, which is often neglected in public discourse. So with that, rights and dignity are really the core and central principle, but also self-directed support, which works a lot better when looking at marginalized communities, be it sex workers or drug users, um, or people living with HIV, um, and really giving people the power to access those services in a way that they feel safe and comfortable in doing so. And if you look at the we picture as well, um, these were from a campaign we did um, sort of at the time of the equally safe consultation which is when the Scottish government was trying to push forward the Nordic model. Um, interestingly, the results of the consultation were overwhelmingly in favor of decriminalization, even though decriminalization wasn't listed as an option. But speaking to the exclusion of sex workers from the conversation, aspects of the government are still continuing to try and push for the Nordic model. Um, one thing I feel remiss in not talking about when giving a brief overview of sex work is sort of the difference between exit and moving on and the harm an exit based approach can cause. So really, it narrows down to the point that can a service forcing exit offer holistic services? The answer is not really when it comes to the people accessing those services particularly because the reasons why people engage in sex work are so diverse and their greatest harm factor is not violence from clients like people might suspect but it's scientifically reported to be stigma so if you're wanting to encourage people to have the chance to move on the best way to do it is to value the people who have experience with it and to build the skills and capacities that they've already started developing working in the profession that they do. Um, I also wanted to just beat a dead horse, I guess, and briefly touch on COVID because it seems that's still the hot topic two years on. Um, so sex workers were definitely very so much so disproportionately impacted by COVID, like other marginalized groups, including um, drug users because you've seen a lot of isolation in these groups and an increase in stigma from the public who took that disease-based narrative again to the public. So this created a lot of issues, particularly as sex workers and other marginalized groups are classed as a highly vulnerable non-shielding group which means they didn't have the same capacity to isolate and protect themselves as other groups in society might have with greater government support. Um, you combine that with considerable barriers to access. Um, so a lot of sexual health clinics were shut, the in-person appointments shut down, community groups couldn't happen. And this resulted in a lot less support being available for sex workers, which made sex work organizations have to pick up the slack. So you've seen a lot of peer led hardship funds during COVID to support set by sex workers to support sex workers. And the other thing sort of touching in the Nordic model, which seeks to reduce demand. Um, the reduction in demand from COVID actually seen challenges with client screening, um, which makes rates of violence higher. And then you also seen an increase in higher risk practices as so sex workers were not able to refuse clients they might have refused before. And that's just a quote from someone who accessed Umbrella Lane's hardship fund. I think it's pretty sort of telling about the 
level of isolation and desperation a lot of people felt during that period and still are feeling to a large extent. And then just my final two slides before moving on with the presentation, I wanted to touch on a bit about what Umbrella Lane does, um, because we are a smaller but fast growing charity. So prior to COVID, we were fairly Glasgow centred, but we've since expanded to cover all of Scotland. And we have several key principles that sort of guide everything we do. The first one is offering a holistic and compassionate service without stigma. And the value of that, I don't think, can be underestimated and can be applied to other marginalized groups as well. Because when you approach people like people, they're much, much more likely to engage with the service and benefit from the service than otherwise. And the other key thing we do besides offering direct support or referral pathways is building and fostering that sense of community. And that's very important for the holistic approach that we seek to have in increasing the quality of life of sex workers, regardless of why they entered the industry, what their goals in the industry are, or whether they want to move on, which is something we also support. Um, so just briefly what we do in case any of you come across sex workers in your line of work that you think might benefit from getting in touch with Umbrella Lane. I just wanted to go through sort of what we do during COVID. We offered a hardship fund, but we don't quite do that anymore. We do still have referral pathways with now numerous organizations across Scotland and the UK in order to provide support to workers with trusted parties. We also do events and particularly skill building events. Um, we offer free safer sex supplies and advice and support in general. And it's very important that we also continue outreach to sort of particularly marginalized groups of sex workers. And beyond that, of course, our overlining goal is to raise awareness and reduce stigma about sex work and sex workers to ensure that they have a safe space in society in which they can sort of function really. Um, so now I just wanted to introduce the next speaker. Um, his name is Dex. He won't be appearing on camera for privacy reasons, but he is a mixed race, non-binary and a former sex worker and drug user who now sells themselves in the finance industry. Um, Dex has been active in HIV and LGBTQ rights and organizations for the past 15 years, as well as on the Diversity Council for a Global Investment Company, and he is head of the head of diversity, pardon me, for a small Scottish charity. Thank you. And thank you, Jake. Uh, so great introduction there thank you um, and also the points you raised will definitely be coming up in what I'm talking about as well um, so what I am looking to talk about is about obviously the stigma and the intersectionality between obviously sex workers uh, drug users and other minority groups and our restrictions from accessing public services um, and with that in mind actually one moment please Apologies, minor feedback issue there. Um, so yeah, no to stigma, no to violence, and no to exclusion. The common theme around stigma is that it applies to all of us. Um, certainly as a drug user and certainly as a sex worker, I found that there was a often very much an overlap in how those applied to me. And I know that it applies a lot to other people. Um, so if you can move on to my next slide, please, Jake. Uh, in terms of stigma itself, uh, obviously we have perceived stigma, um, self-stigma and actualized stigma. So self-stigma is obviously that we take on to ourselves uh, within our professions, within our choices, within our lived experiences. We sometimes turn that stigma in on ourselves. There is, of course, actualized stigma where people are applying stigma to us for our professions, for our choices, etc. And then perceived stigma against us as well. If you'd like to go on. So in terms of stigma itself, I think this is one point I really want to make key. And this isn't just for sex workers. It is for, obviously, us as drug users or 
as minority groups as well. Stigma really impacts the type of interactions that we can have with the people who are out there to look after us or form up part of our general well-being. So from police officers and doctors uh, to our landlords, to our friends and our family and romantic partners, we face stigma through any perception of our role either as sex workers or as drug users. And there is where we need to have our solidarity in with each other. And all of us need to understand and acknowledge the impacts of the stigma and our interactions with that. As sex workers, we need to turn around and acknowledge that we can have stigma against drug users. Even within the sex work profession, you hear people talking about a clean and dirty approach whereby sex workers will judge other sex workers for either their perception of safe sex practices, for their drug use, etc. And that's something that we really need to take on account for in that we need to stand together as opposed to judging each other. Um, and again, I apologize, the slide does sort of refer to sex workers, but I think the important thing on this is that actually it is all of us within, so as drug users or sex workers, we're targets for discrimination. The same things that get laid at sex workers' seats for by the media, by family advocacy groups and by public bodies are things like breakdown of traditional family sexually transmitted infections, HIV and AIDS. We know that drug use has been blamed for that in the past, and we've had things like heroin and other things, needle-based drug use be accounted for for the rise in HIV and AIDS. Uh, escalation of crime, we know that sex work and drugs are often blamed for this, and the subversion of youth. And please, if you, if you could see me my camera on, I would have air quotes there for that one. Um, and to link into the solidarity piece, we're stigmatized for a number of other reasons as well. The sex industry is massively disproportionately made up of minority groups, people who are always going to be at the bottom level of the rung against the people in charge. So from women to visible minorities, people with STIs so such as HIV, which already has its own stigma around it, drug users, of course, but then also disabled people, single parents and the LGBT plus community. And so moving on from that then to the barriers that all of those groups face is that as a sex worker or as a drug user, criminalization and legal repercussions are one of the major barriers to us when we access public services. That if we re reveal either our drug use, if we reveal our profession, we can face criminal charges, the involvement of social workers for those of us that are parents, loss of housing, and of course, any number of other consequences as well. Um, another barrier that D Jake touched on earlier is the exit-based approach to service provision. Effectively, this idea that we should always be getting out. There are a number of people that are for whom sex work is not the only choice, but the only viable choice. As single parents, a number of people have spoken about how it allows them to manage their lifestyle and very much the decriminalization versus Nordic approach goes that women have, and other people have the choice to indulge in sex work. We're not victims of it. Other barriers in public services are things like language and cultural barriers. Drug use, sex work, both these draw heavily on immigrant minority communities and things like English not being a strong first language and interpreters being drawn from local communities mean that effectively people are scared to approach these services either because they won't be understood or the person brought in to help them be understood will be somebody that will be then feeding back into their own community and there will be judgment from that. And that leads into the next point I have here about communal pressure. By not having safe spaces within public services that are designed to accommodate the overlap between sex work and drug use or even individually just sex work on its own or drug use, people are then faced with either accessing a service designed to help them but being recognised, judged or revealed within their communities. And these obviously lead to the repercussions earlier, such criminalisation and legal repercussions. It's all very much a wider service. And on to that, the services just aren't designed to accommodate us. The majority of mainstream sexual health services or public clinics or even police as a general rule just don't have an approach that's designed to accommodate any of us. And finally, and the last line here, racism, sex, and LGBT phobia. This is just a constant thing that we will encounter within 
any sort of public service or private sector as well. And whilst it's not always the major barrier, it's definitely something that we need to take account for in terms of stigma. So if you, Jake, if you take me on. So I wanted to look at ways that we can address these issues through solidarity, but also for public services to then look at ways to address it for us. Cooperation here is the first one, very much leads into the solidarity topic that we were talking about. As I've mentioned, there is a significant overlap between the stigma faced by drug users, ethnic minorities and LGBT communities, along with those faced by sex workers. For us as a whole to improve and succeed on this, we need to work together as a, in a holistic approach with multiple representatives from these groups. And not just us groups working together on that, but also external public and private sector groups that are supposed to be representing our interests need to work with us for this holistic approach. And that lets us move beyond the one dimensional to a service provision that is effective and representative. In terms of representation, when engaging with sex workers, drug users, ethnic minorities it can't just be by consultation we've seen as jake said when the consultation happened about the nordic model decrim wasn't even an option but wildly overwhelming and it got completely ignored we need to be given visibility and engaged with on the boards and trusts that relate to us and have the validity or lived experience recognizing the process and defining and setting the policies that those services have and in terms of that policy planning when we're constructing policies and approaches around services, we really need to address those overlaps again. And you'll see it's a very cyclical nature of this. We need to turn around and be looking at sexuality in our public services, at race and ethnicity, HIV, trans, sex work and social work, and drug use. And fundamentally, at the end of the day, we need to address the responsibility of all of those public services to provide inclusive and humane treatment and the responsibility to discuss our issues openly. And with that, um, I'm now going to pass you across to uh, my colleague, Maren. And Maren is uh, a former sex worker and journalist. She works in marketing communications for Umbrella Lane, and she's also an activist with the English Collective of Prostitutes. On top of this, she is also a consultant on a project exploring alternative payment options for sex workers and the face of financial discrimination. So Maren, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dex, um, for the introduction. Um, Jake will have touched on, he touched on the Nordic model um, in his uh, presentation. Um, I'm going to be exploring that because sadly that is, uh, that is a spectre that we have still not been able to, to vanquish. Um, so I'll, I'll start by explaining what the Nordic model is, um, for those of you who might not be familiar with it. Um, the Nordic model is a legal approach uh, that criminalises the purchase of sex and also punishes third parties involved who profit from this purchase, um, such as managers, um, drivers, landlords. Um, the Nordic model was first made law in Sweden in 1999. Um, and as such, you will sometimes hear it called the Swedish model. Um, I tend to stick with the Nordic model, that, that is more common. Um, after Sweden, it was subsequently adopted in uh, Norway in 2009, uh, Iceland the same year, Canada in 2014, uh, France in 2016, Northern Ireland in 2017, and most recently uh, Israel in 2018. So is the Nordic model likely to come to Scotland? Um, unfortunately, the prospect of the uh, Nordic model approach being introduced here in Scotland is, is sadly very real. Um, it has solid support from both um, the SNP and Scottish Labour. Um, it's really somewhat bizarre seeing the SNP and Labour failing to support sex workers who, who really are overwhelmingly working class people um, on this issue. Uh, it, it's, it's really been even worse in London where Labour members have repeatedly pushed for the Nordic model and been shot down by the Conservative Party, which has made them imperfect, but bizarrely much better allies on, on sex work. Um, I don't want to present this as a clear cut left versus right issue. Um, the Liberal Democrats and Green Party do both support decriminalisation, uh, whereas the Conservatives have not really shown much interest in changing the status quo one way or the other. Um, so yes, unfortunately, uh, support for the Nordic model is, is really widespread in, in Scottish Parliament and, and in London as well. Um, so in September, uh, just, just last month, uh, there was a cross-party parliamentary group in Scotland um, bolstered by coordinating with a feminist group called UK Feminista, who collectively called for this model um, here in Scotland. Um, 
This was wholeheartedly rejected by Umbrella Lane. Um, we made statements to a media via a press release that you can um, find on our blog if you want to check this out, opposing, opposing um, the calls made. Um, and our objections were echoed by other sex worker led orgs like uh, Scott Pep. Um, another voice of criticism was uh, Dr. Marsha Scott, who is uh, the chief executive of Scottish Women's Aid. Um, however, she hasn't really engaged further in this topic, which I think is likely due to a, a barrage of, of interest and criticism she received um, from sex worker exclusionary feminist groups. Um, she, she certainly seems to be standing by the statements that she made in an interview with The Times, but speaking out on this issue can unfortunately make you a target for criticism in a way that I think speaking out in favor of drug decriminalization just doesn't. It seems to be far more um, controversial, um, which is one of the reasons that it, that we we need we need solidarity from people who recognize that decriminalization is the way to go. Um, so uh, for uh, why why it is that the umbrella, umbrella Lane, Scott Pep, um, Dr. Marshall Scott, um, why do we reject the Nordic model so conclusively? Um, really, the data is quite damning. Um, our, our rejection is entirely evidence based. Um, if we look to Northern Ireland, uh, which is our closest neighbour to have adopted the Nordic model um, in 2017, um, in the two years following the introduction of the Nordic model, reports of crime increased by 90 percent, um, with violent crime in particular increasing by 92 percent. Um, which is just staggering. Uh, these statistics come from Ugly Mugs, which is an app where sex workers can confidentially report incidents of crime and abuse. Um, the number of Ugly Mugs users has actually remained very consistent at about six to 7,000. So we, this cannot be dismissed as just new, new users signing up. Um, so if we're seeing crime, and in, in, including violent crime, nearly double in Northern Ireland in the two years following the introduction of the Nordic model, um, we, we can ask why, why is this? Why would crime skyrocket after, after the Nordic model coming in? Well, one of the problems with client criminalization is that clients can use these concerns about, uh, about facing legal, legal, about facing criminalization to avoid providing personal information about themselves. Uh, many sex workers who've previously been able to ask for screening information, like identification, personal ID, will now find people refusing because they say, no, I'm worried about the legal consequences. Um, while supposedly only targeting the buyer, police surveillance uh, tends to target the premises of sex workers. So even if we leave aside the discomfort of having your workplace now under surveillance, uh, this means that clients are now more likely to insist on meeting you in an unfamiliar location that they choose because they don't want to come to the sex workers' premises because they know that police might be there. Um, for sex workers on the street, um, they now have to rush into cars before being able to discuss with client uh, things like their payment, uh, what services they're comfortable with, or, or condom use. And the client won't want to linger and discuss the boundaries with the sex worker in case, in case they're being watched, in case they're seen by police. Um, and clandestine practices from clients are understandable. Their concerns about the law are legitimate. You know, they, they, they face criminal charges. However, we can't tell which clients are just worried about police and which clients have bad intentions. You know, these client criminalization is a gift to people who are abusive, who have bad intentions, who want to do sex workers harm. Um, client criminalization has, has really handed these people ready-made reasons not to provide details about themselves, not to meet where they could be seen, um, not to discuss the boundaries of the transaction and therefore to more easily behave abusively towards sex workers without facing identification or legal reprisals. So the bargaining power of sex workers has also been compromised by one consequence of the Nordic model that was actually intended. So the, the whole focus of the Nordic model is ending demand uh, targeting client demand and, and shrinking the number of people who seek out paying for sex. And there's mixed evidence on this, but it has in some cases suggested that the number has shrunk slightly. Um, the threat of arrest has deterred some clients. However, the pool of sex workers hasn't changed at all because targeting demand, ending demand, it does nothing to address the reasons why people are selling sex. People sell sex because they need money. And, and targeting demand 
does nothing to help them not need money. Um, in actual fact, a smaller number of clients for the same number of sex workers will mean less work and therefore less money to be shared out among these workers. So if people are working in a job because they need money and a model is being implemented that means less money, you know, we have to ask, how could that possibly be helpful to them? How could that be helpful when you need money to, to make you poorer? Um, less work and less money instantly, um, no matter what your profession is, it instantly means more desperation, less power, less ability to bargain. Um, you have less leverage. In 2014, uh, it was five years after the Norwegian government had implemented the Nordic model. That five years later, they conducted a review um, and they conceded in their own review that uh, the Nordic model had created what it called a buyer's market in Norway. Uh, criminalizing clients meant that those, those that remained actually had more power against the sex workers whose, whose services they were seeking. So what, what does this mean? What, what implications does this have uh, for people's health, for public health? Well, decreased bargaining power for condom use has pretty obvious implications for the increased risk of things like HIV transmission, as well as other sexually transmitted infections. Um, criminalization has been repeatedly proven to impede access to healthcare services, when that includes effective HIV prevention, treatment, care and support services. Um, the studies on this are really very compelling. Uh, one from 2015 published in The Lancet estimates that decriminalizing sex work could limit new HIV infections by between 33 and 46 percent among sex workers and clients over a decade. Um, a study in 2018 by the aid ed agency Médecins du Monde uh, found that the Nordic model had a detrimental effect on sex workers' safety, health and overall living conditions, um, with participants in the survey specifically citing the Nordic model for triggering a decrease in condom use, as well as increased difficulties um, continuing tr getting treatment um, for people who are HIV positive. Um, a 2020 study uh, published in the Nature Communications Journal uh, compared 10 countries um, in Africa and found that the odds of living with HIV are more than seven times higher for a sex worker in a country that criminalized sex work compared with a country that didn't. So seven times higher for criminalization versus not criminalization. So you might think, it's understandable that you might think that criminalization impeding better health outcomes is separate from the Nordic model, given that the, Nord the Nordic model ostensibly decriminalizes the sex worker. I mean, uh, the Nordic model on paper claims that it decriminalizes the sex worker. However, it's really not that simple. Um, as the horrific documented rise in crime against sex workers and the enormously reduced bargaining power of those workers both demonstrates a system of, of one-sided criminalization cannot insulate the other side from negative consequences. It, it's really quite the reverse. There is, there is no way of criminalizing just one side of the transaction and, and just sort of hoping the other person will be fine. Um, and and it, it, to take that even further, while the Nordic model, it claims to decriminalize the sex worker on paper, this has actually not been the way it's been implemented. That's not been the case in, in adoptive countries. Um, the reality of the Nordic model's implementation is that implementation has actually seen penalties against sex workers retained or even increased. Um, in France, for example, uh, street work remains criminalized and, and those workers still face fines and arrest if they encounter police. Um, in almost every Nordic model adoptive country, more than one sex worker um, working together with another sex worker sharing a flat is a criminal offence. Um, in Ireland, uh, penalties for sex workers working together, regardless of the reason, you know, if it's for their safety, penalties for working together from the same flat have increased um, post adoption of the Nordic model. Uh, government, government ministers in Ireland actually rejected a provision that would have allowed sex workers to keep their money after a client is arrested. So even though the client is the one supposedly being criminalised, um, if he's arrested, the sex worker's money that, that they've been paid is taken as a, what they call proceeds of crime. But of course, this is, in effect, um, a de facto fine for the sex worker. Evictions in Ireland, as well as uh, Sweden and Norway, have uh, been documented as skyrocketing as uh, police report suspected sex working tenants to their landlords. And I, I remind you, these are the sex workers that are supposedly decriminalised. 
Um, in, in case you're in any doubt as to the aim of this practice, in Norway, the police actually called it Operation Homeless. So you can see that um, the model of criminalization, um, even when it isn't supposed to target sex workers, has really had dire implications for sex worker precarity and, and their subsequent health outcomes. So <laughs> what should we back instead? Um, well, decriminalization has widespread support from those who take an, an evidence-based approach, um, including Umbrella Lane, of course, and um, HIV charities such as HIV Scotland. Um, in April this year, the HIV charities um, Terence Higgins Trust, uh, Love Tank and National AIDS Trust um, sent a joint letter to UK MPs um, expressing their opposition to the Nordic model. Um, the United Nations, World Health Organization have been very vocal about their support for decriminalization. Um, and they're also backed by Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, um, the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women, uh, to just to name a few. Uh, the evidence against the Nordic model and, and its consequences for the health and safety of sex workers, as well as the health of the wider general public, are really very, very clear. Um, I hope for any listeners who might have previously felt that the Nordic model had some appeal, you understand now why we, sh we need to stand in solidarity against efforts to introduce it here in Scotland or in the wider UK or really anywhere else, um, and instead back the full decriminalisation of sex work. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you to all those panellists. Uh, we're going to wait for questions to come in. And just before we do, I'm not officially a speaker, but I feel inspired by um, all of those speakers. <clears throat> and Recovering Justice has a project for women whose lives have been impacted by the criminal justice system and social services due to their dr drug use or perceived drug use. And it's just one of the, just to point out that when we talk about state surveillance, we forget about social services. And a lot of our women have not felt comfortable to either access services or even to speak because the risk of losing their children is so high. And that is because of either drug use or sex work. And Recovering Justice just believe that the only way that you can stop stigma is to change policy. So we need all aspects of drug use and um, sex work to be completely decriminalised. And our women, do you know, it's, a, it's an appalling fact. I live in the northeast. We have one of the least, well, it's, it's one of the highest rates of poverty. And we have very few services for women. And if a woman goes for help, she is often told there is no help, but at this point we are going to drug test you or we're going to surveil you. And drug use and sex work are put down as neglect. And I think that's something we all need to be aware of, neglect. <laughs> you know, there's, and, and that's why, and they can then use neglect to remove children. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Yeah, because we always think, I always think of state violence as being um, police, because that's my experience of state violence, but to remind ourselves that um, it's often state kidnap. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's one of the big things about people accessing services comfortably. Most of the people who get in touch with Umbrella Lane use a pseudonym, and we don't know when it's their real name or if it's a pseudonym. And that's a big step in making them feel comfortable in accessing services. And right now, I was talking to you about it earlier, but there was a case with a stripper trying to get holiday pay, which she's entitled to, but the tribunal refused her condition of anonymity, which really makes it impossible for her to pursue the case and have proper access to justice. So. Yeah. And it's really good that we keep these discussions going because, uh, do you know, the, between drug use and sex work, because I also know that people that go into rehab, that, you know, you can only frame um, sex work as problematic and something you want to e exit. And, yeah. And again, that's down to policy. <laughs> 
Yeah, Fiona, on that point, I'd, um, I'm loosely involved with Support Not Separation, uh, which uh, have been protesting in the in the wake of um, the Universal Credit Card. Um, unfortunately, we've seen poverty used as a reason to, for mothers to be separated from their children, and and it was the ECP were invited to be involved because um, mothers who were sex working, of course, because they needed money to support the children, so poverty was being used as a as a reason to take the kids away. And then if they were sex working support kids, that was also being used then as a as, as justification for the children being taken. Um, yeah. And so and so, yeah, but I think they're uh, continuing to protest outside the family courts on the first Wednesday of every month. Um, you know, it's all in the title, support, not separation, you know, help help people, you know, outlaw poverty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think to be honest, this is partly a lot of what I was saying about about in policy making. What we need to have is sex workers and other groups represented on the policy boards making these decisions. So we see, as you say, in sex work, uh, sorry, in social work, the idea that drug use or sex work is neglect. But actually, if we look at the fact that what in many cases is happening is people are trying to protect their children by getting money coming in to support them. Mm -hmm. It's not neglect. It's literally a case of people trying to make sure they can continue to hold a functioning family together. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if that was represented against some of the sort of family and very much air quotes family advocacy groups that have a say in this or the experts that are brought in and we had proper representation, we would see a change of policy that was actually supportive as opposed to detrimental. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you see that moving forward? Do you know, like, obviously, like, are you actively seeking uh, positions on those boards or, I mean? I mean, personally? Um, I suppose for all of the time, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I think this is definitely something being done by sort of NUM and other sort of sex work charities to engage with these kind of local and national services. Um, but as we've sort of seen, there are barriers in that sex workers or their organizations are not considered valid for lived experience to be taken into these discussions so it's a case of a constant uphill struggle to turn around and get involved in these processes however we've seen in things like um trussell trust and you know other sort of poverty-based charities um they're willing to take on people with lived experience to help shape it so that we can turn around and move forward. So the trouble is that when we look at local government or health services, they're much more inclined to go for somebody with a PhD than an actual background in it. Mm -hmm. However, we do have a number of people that are in both senses, PhD based and sex workers, etc. Just turn around and pushing that into it to try and go, okay, well, we have to go in the door through your sort of gates and hoops. But once we're in there, we can start to change what your approaches and your thinking is it's just it's a longer journey than it should be and a much more difficult one yeah any of the other panel want to answer that um, yeah. i mean i think it's also definitely tricky for sex workers to sometimes feel comfortable saying that they have lived experience which i think is a definite shame so i was talking to a sex worker yesterday actually and she's wanting to apply for social work education and she was actually told by the person at the university not to mention sex work in her application even though she feels it gives her that value of lived experience and when you're applying for jobs it's really hard to know when it's appropriate because you never know the interviewer before you meet them and even then you probably don't know their actual opinion on sex work so it's very risky to sort of state that lived experience even when you are confident by it and stand by it thank you um i just noticing we have a raised hand up from Novosaki ball street so maybe we can invite them to the stage to talk quickly and then also we have a number of questions sort of sitting there as well mm -hmm. yeah just jumping in um i'll i'll bring um the person to the stage and we can do i can bring some of the questions to the stage as well after that yeah Sorry, I'll, I'll meet myself. I find it also really interesting how the term sex work came about because it touches on exactly what you said. So rather than using the term prostitute or escort by us all using sex work, regardless of whether we're street-based, BDSM, 
online only fans or any of the other many things that fall into the umbrella of sex work we're all sort of united under the same banner and through that are able to have that some element of anonymity and sort of protection and solidarity under the inclusive term sex work and the other thing I wanted to briefly touch on before letting the other panelists talk about the other things is sort of the role of sex work for quite a substantial number of people with disabilities. It's one of the things Umbrella Lang's actually sort of working on more at the moment. And we're in the early stages of a research project because oftentimes with sex work, there's a huge deficit of information in academic research and the academic research that there is focused predominantly on street-based cis women who are sex workers, leaving out a whole vast amount of people who are arguably more marginalized through their disability, migration status, and all those other factors that encourage them to enter sex work. And speaking as to why people with disabilities might want to do sex work, when there's so many hoops and barriers to accessing basic levels of provision of care, when they have to go through disability assessment after disability assessment and fight and fight for the bare minimum standard of living, it makes sex work a very attractive proposition. And what the Nordic model doesn't do is it doesn't address those factors. It just makes it harder for them to have that decent standard of living. Um, I'm sure another panelist probably has some other point. Yeah, sure. I'll chip in. Um, yeah, I, I very much agree with you, Cedric, about this sort of the nature of sex work being an umbrella term that really helps uh, sort of not there not be what we, we like to call a hierarchy, you know, sort of the idea of, if you're doing one thing, but not another thing. And so the idea that we all fall under this umbrella term of, of sex work and you don't have to kind of specify um, whether you're meeting people in person or if you're just doing online work or, or whatever it might be. Um, I think the point about sort of a stigma and also systems of partial criminalization are really important as well about, say, accessing care and accessing health services or even sort of going to going to the police, say, if you need help. Um, for example, even the system we currently have in the UK and, and the problems with the Nordic model as well, where two workers working together from the same location is illegal. So say if you, you try to work together for safety, if you do encounter a problem, you are going to struggle to go for help because you yourself are breaking the law. And that is why decriminalization is so important because you're taking away those barriers to accessing help when you need it. Um, and, and, that, and, and so whether it's you want to access, you know, you want condoms or sexual health kits or, or you need to report a crime, you need to report, you know, even if you want to report a client that, that did something, whatever it was, um, decriminalization makes that so much easier. Right, we've got a few questions. Um, we've got one from, actually I'm going to put these two together. So there's one from Carolyn Blake and one from Andrew McCardle. And it's about, in your view, what countries have implemented good laws and policies and what model would you want Scotland to follow? Yep, there it is. And Andrew kind of asked a very similar question. Um, I can I can take this one if you like, Jake, or you can chip in after. Um, so the the places that we look to, um, New Zealand and some Australian states uh, have decriminalisation. Um, they're not perfect. Um, New Zealand, for example, still it hasn't included migrant sex workers in its in its decriminalisation. So it's only uh, domestic workers, and so and so we do we do want decriminalisation for all workers. Um, but the decriminalization there has, has meant, I mean, sex workers when surveyed have said that they feel safer, that they feel able uh, to go for support when they need it. Um, they know that they're not going to be targeted for, for maybe some aspect of the law that they weren't exactly following. They know that they're fully decriminalized and they are protected. Um, there have been amazing cases there. That, for example, um, a stealthing case was prosecuted in New Zealand, someone who removed the condom. Um, the, the sex worker was able to go to the police and this and this client um, was, was jailed, I believe, for this. Um, and another sex worker was able to report her boss for sexual harassment, I believe she worked in a in a brothel, and um, and she didn't like the way that her boss was was talking to her or treating her, and and, and again, um, she was able to take legal action against him. So, you know, in in the UK, for example, if that happened, 
you know, you can't report your boss because a brothel working together in a premises with other people is criminalized. And so there is there is no legal recourse for you if you have a boss that is mistreating you. Um, and for example, you know, if a client stealthed you, again, if you were in a premises that you thought, oh, sometimes another worker might be here, so I don't want to draw attention to myself, you can't get any help. Um, and so this, while imperfect, um, yes, a system like New Zealand's um, and, and some states in Australia are really are the ones that we look to. We're looking for full decriminalization um, of everything, everything involving sex work. I think the other important like point of comparison to make there is sort of the reasons why sex workers don't want legalization and sort of what the difference between legalization and decriminalization is. So what legalization like uh, Germany and a couple other Central European states have does, in fact, it forces, generally speaking, invasive procedures on sex workers without their consent. But more than that, it creates a de facto criminalized aspect of sex work. So by virtue of legalizing it under certain conditions, any sex worker who doesn't fall under those certain conditions is committing a crime. And in countries like Germany, where I think I heard the stat yesterday, but it's something like 70 or 80 percent of sex workers in Berlin are not registered, that puts a lot of them in an actually criminalized situation which is why decriminalization currently is the best option. The thing that really has to be done going forward is making sure migrant sex workers have access to equal care and equal justice as non-migrant sex workers, if that answers your question. I think it's always important to say that, you know, you don't import good laws and policies from other countries because Scotland is its own country. So you find something that is culturally appropriate to each country. Yeah. And that is done, obviously, in consultation with the population that you're trying to make the law around. Um, so I'm going to, there's another, que there's another couple of questions. I'm going to just admit my ignorance. I don't know what this is, but what are your views on prostitution being a form of CSE? Um, so I'm assuming by CSE you mean child sexual endangerment on mm -hmm. this one um, and I think the completely separate things um, sex work in of itself and with the decriminalized sex work we're talking about should never involve children so sex trafficking and the like are entirely separate things mm -hmm. one is an adult being able to make a choice for themselves to in, take on a profession and in some respects protect their own children by having funds to look after them. The other is exploitation of a minor, an entirely separate thing and has its own criminal category. So I wouldn't say that they are the same thing in any way, shape, form or should be put in the same conjecture. And linking that to trafficking also in general studies, numerous scientific studies have shown that trafficking is best viewed as a separate issue and cases of trafficking are best addressed in decriminalized settings because it allows for a clear separation of the laws and allows for police time and resources to be focused where they're needed. In terms of commercial sexual exploitation, which um, I, I got child sexual exploitation as well from the question. Um, but I think it's important to look at freedom of choice. A lot of sex workers, even if it's out of economic reasons, have the choice to engage in that industry. And when you say something is commercial sexual exploitation, that says none of these acts are consensual. And that's one of like yeah. the big sticking points I think sex workers have with the Nordic model discourse. If there is no consent in sex work, how does a sex worker remove their consent if they don't approve of something going on? Sex work and consent, the sex workers view consent very seriously and take it very seriously. So by removing consent from the equation before anything begins, it's not only irresponsible, but also dangerous, I would say. I don't know if any of the other panelists want to chime in on that as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll chip in. I, I think it's um, it's very bizarre to be told that you've been assaulted when you know you haven't been. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, it's this odd thing where it's especially the mantra these days of, of taking taking accusations of assault seriously. 
So we say, you know, believe women. And frankly, that if you only, be, you know, you need to believe people when they say they've been assaulted, and you need to believe them when they say they haven't been. And the fact that assaults can happen. And if you're saying everything is assault to begin with, then I have, you know, we have no way of saying, no, this wasn't, this wasn't. You know, if you're saying there's no, there's no difference between any, between any booking or any interaction with a client. And then we actually have no power to do anything when someone does violate our boundaries. Um, it's incredibly disempowering um, to be told that you're just being exploited um, and equating it, you know, as, as, as Jake made the point, you know, that, that we should see trafficking as a separate issue. I mean, trafficking happens in, in so many areas, unfortunately, of labor, you know, um, uh, textiles, agriculture, um, cleaning, even domestic labor. Um, unfortunately, you know, trafficking happens. And the fact that trafficking seems to now be synonymous exclusively with sex work is a real failure of the discourse. Um, it's very reductive um, and, it, and it just doesn't address the problem. I will say as well that with client criminalization, um, it's incredibly unhelpful because there have been cases when clients have actually reported, they said, I've been to this place and I think something's wrong. I think something, I think that woman didn't want to be there or that person didn't want to be there. Um, if that client is criminalized, they themselves cannot report when they have a concern. Um, and I, I think sometimes in the discourse, all clients are sort of demonized as though they don't care about the welfare of the people they, don't go, to, they go to see. Um, that is not the case. Um, and we have had cases um, where clients have made reports when they feel that something is wrong. And so client criminalization um, impedes help for people who actually are being exploited. Um, I will just uh, finish on saying that at the moment we um, treat uh, trafficking, um, but basically, you know, the, what, what uh, say someone like Juno Mack, who wrote Revolting Prostitutes, if you haven't read it, read it, it's great, but likes to say um, deportation is not rescue. You know, so unfortunately, when we do encounter people who are um, who have been trafficked, our current practice is to arrest them and send them back to their country of origin. Um, in most cases, people who have been trafficked actually wanted to migrate. And so, and so in these cases, if you are sending them back to the place that they have wanted to leave, you are not helping them. Um, and also the, the fact that we that we deal with these cases with police, you know, breaking down the one arresting people. Again, arrest is not rescue. Arrest is very traumatizing in a lot of cases. And so the way that we are addressing cases of trafficking also at the moment is is not helpful. <laughs> so I don't know if Dex had anything to, that he wanted to add or. Yeah, just in terms of when we're talking about trafficking and such, um, so drug use um, also features into this as well, which one of the reasons we come back to the solidarity point, which is that often people who have been trafficked will be exposed to drugs as a method of control, of uh, getting people hooked on to substances in order to remove their ability even further to go out and reach out to people. The police and other institutions are far less likely to listen to somebody that is, in their eyes, ostensibly a drug addict and a sex worker, even when they're talking about the fact that none of that has been consensual in their eyes. And because we don't have this idea of, you know, forced trafficking in sex work being separate to actual sex work, there's no medium which people can actually effectively address this. Thank you. Oh, right, we've got an, another few questions. Um, we might bring somebody onto the stage. So there's a question on what conversations would you like to see happening with young people in schools around sex work? Here it is up here. I mean, I would just like to say that everything has to center on a rights-based approach. Mm -hmm. So where would you be discussed? I mean, so we... And this, is, you know. this is an interesting question because it was brought up in the equally safe consultation and I led a lot of workshops on how to understand that consultation because it wasn't necessarily clear. And a question very similar to this one probably raised was one of the most confusing for people to answer because they didn't see it directly applicable to young people in schools. I think there's definitely a lot of room for it in university, but when it refers to young people in schools, it's very important to teach them about consent. And that goes to what Marin and I were saying earlier about the power to consent, the power to remove consent. 
And really that's where I would see the conversation happening, at least in pre post secondary education. In post secondary education, there needs to be a lot more work done to create spaces for sex workers to exist because a lot of people enter sex work as a student because there's not very many ways to pay for the cost of living, even with bursaries, if you don't have parental support or savings. And working in a nightclub twice a week isn't going to be enough of an income supplement. So it's very important universities have that understanding to sort of accept sex work exists, which a lot of universities try to deny, and then to sort of support sex workers, regardless of whether they want to continue working in the industry or whether they don't, and support them in that path, I think. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll add to that. Uh, I, the, the main cases I've seen around this were, um, it was actually at university level, so there were, um, there were um, student sex work is on the rise and so there was um, there were people who did outreach at um, a university fair just at a booth and um, unfortunately they were accused of kind of encouraging um, students to do sex work or promoting it um, I promise you that being broke is a way bigger driver of, of, of sex work than, than a booth at a university fair could ever be. Um, it's, it's really just about, as Fiona said, taking a rights-based approach, respecting people's right to make choices for their own lives um, and supporting them, giving the resources to be as, as safe as possible when they do that. Just what consenting adults do you know, behind behind closed doors, it really shouldn't be, you know, for it, I think you should be free to do as you will if everyone is, you know, is of age and consenting, of course. Um, I, uh, I do think, I mean, look, maybe I'm biased and I've had good experiences so far. I, I do genuinely view it's getting better. It is incredibly frustrating when you come up against people who say, you know, this is just my gut feeling and you can't change my mind. I would say, you know, to avoid to avoid burnout, don't sort of, um, I would say, you know, if you think this person, don't don't engage if you like, if you need to protect yourself on that score. But if you do, where there is space to have the conversations, have them. Um, and 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 I do believe slowly you can change hearts and minds. Um, I, I certainly have had good experiences with it myself, maybe, maybe just through sheer pers persistence. I mean, I'm interested, just because we sit at so many intersections on how we create a space that says our movements may look completely different, but the systems that oppress us, we share this that common system that oppresses us. Yeah, and actually, I just want to add into that myself. Um, I think one of the most interesting ways to find allies is to look at who is opposed to your movement and who else they're opposing. Um, we see things like this um, with a lot of the sort of big American family values and advocacy groups that are anti-drugs, anti-trans, anti-sex work and all this. And basically, sometimes you can tell where you'll find allies by exactly who is aligned against it and what they're saying against you and who else they're hating on. Because it's very much a case of that a lot of the things that are about choice, freedom, consent, etc. are the things that other people will oppose because they believe in... <laughs> not having that choice, about choices not being valid. Anyone else to that? We don't have any more questions, so. I mean, we do have some interesting conversation in the chat just around um, the education of young people in schools, etc., which um, I think maybe would be good to talk on some more given it's getting a lot of traction there. Yeah, go for it. So Jake, I think you were just having a conversation there. Yeah, I was waiting to see if there's anything you wanted to say on it. Um, it's always tricky when like, I find without full decriminalization, it's very, it opens the door for a lot of misinformation about sex work. And I think one of the larger problems in sex worker advocacy and sex worker rights as a whole is this instinctual defensiveness. So rather than going for what we want and think is right, we're constantly in a reactive position where we're reacting and trying to prevent things from getting worse. 
if that makes sense. And that certainly applies to education to some extent as well, I would say, where I think a lot of sex workers just struggle to some extent to envision a future where sex work is treated in a way that they'd feel comfortable with in earlier stages of uh, secondary school education, for example. Can I just, how would you, so I often think it's like, it's just in the broader harm reduction. So when I do harm reduction around drugs, often the harm is the police and the social services. You know, it is not just about like safer drug consumption, but it's like, where's the harm created? And I think we all need to think about that. Where's the harm created? And I know that when you listen to people, the harm's created by your state. And that might be an end to talk to talk to children about. Yeah, exactly. I think that's one of the key things that sex workers unanimously want sort of harm reduction principles to be sort of the center focus. I did see another question that I think is definitely worth answering um, relating to, uh, yeah, that's the one. Um, so sexual health services and how they see maybe few people who openly say that they're involved in sex work and how might they be able to better make services and create a safer space for them. I think in general, it's very likely, at least in my experience, the vast majority of sex workers do not disclose the fact that they are a sex worker when accessing sexual health services which of course presents a whole load of problems because as a professional who is maybe um, good, like when it comes to sex workers, knows their stuff and is open-minded and tolerant, it's harder for them to sort of give the level of care and accurate services to those people without knowing the full picture. And that's very true with counseling services as well. How can a counselor help someone if that they don't know the person's full situation and that person doesn't feel really comfortable with them. Um, so I think in order to create a safer spot, it's important to really use the correct terminology for one thing. So terminology like prostitute and things like that instantly put sex workers off disclosing anything. And another question that comes up a lot from health of sexual health services is how many people have you had um, sex with in the past amount of time? Sex workers, I'd say 95% of the time don't have a clue. <laughs> so it's a very awkward question to try and answer. Um, so sort of creating that safe spot and coming out from the point A that it's okay if you're a sex worker. So organizations like Umbrella Lane have flyers, for example, and you might be able to put those flyers in somewhere somewhat, somewhat accessible, and that could give people an indication of this is a safe spot. I'll let the other panelists try. Could I just add, like, so if you are a, if you're a service and you're wanting to know how to improve access or make your services better, ask. Ask a sex worker-led organisation. That's, and, and if you have the resource, realize that you are a bigger organization with probably more power and influence and pay, pay that smaller organization. Mm -hmm. Because I know that most of us are running on shoestrings and, you know, you can just do a very simple search. And if that is not led by the people that you're trying to talk about, why would you invite them? Question just... yourself on why you would then invite them. Because if you want to know about sex workers, ask sex workers. If you want to know about drug use, ask drug users. It's just that simple. And then, so instead of waiting for us, who are really under-resourced, to come and offer help, you come to us. Yeah? And I, mean, and I will almost guarantee that you'll get a good response. Just to build on that as well, um... So in terms of sexual health services, in Lovium, you have things like Roam that will go out to sort of wave care and other places like that have MSM-focused services. If you want to work with sex workers or if you want to work with drug users, go out to the organisations and offer to provide 
sexual health services in a safe environment for those people that's outside of your main facilities. It's something that can already be done in terms of MSM work. It's something that can be done as well. Work with the charities like Umbrella Lane who operate drop-in services and say, is it possible to turn around fried sexual health screening at these sites to turn around and have that safe space where people are not going to be outed by encountering other people where they're not going to have to have uncomfortable discussions where the person on the other end of it isn't necessarily prepared to be talking to a sex worker or a drug user instead you're providing a focused safe space for those people to go into and work, talk about things in and at the same time you're working with the groups that have that knowledge in the first place and Umbrella Lane, we're working on sort of developing a more comprehensive training um, program, essentially. But as it stands right now, we do have sort of like a basic sex worker 101 and sensibility training that's pretty broadly applicable to, to sort of different organizations. So that's another option as well going forward. I think we're almost at that time. That's why I kept that short. I'm, jump, I'm just jumping in here. I'm sorry to stop the conversation. I think it's about, it's taken off. Um, we're going to have to close this session. So I'd, I'd like to firstly thank the panel. I know, Fiona, you were chairing, but I'd really like to thank all of you for your contributions. I think this has been a fantastic discussion and will be really, really useful for us to share widely with our, our colleagues. I'd really like to direct people to the polls that we have opened. When I say polls, it's just three very short questions about how much you've enjoyed uh, the session, what you've learned. So we'll make those available on the on the main stage. Uh, but if you go to the poll section at the on the right hand side, you can see um, how to to fill them out. Um, we will leave this session open for a few minutes while you are completing all three of those polls. We'll we'll make it to the end of this conference and getting everything right. Um, but once again, thank you so much to Fiona J, Marin and Dex for your comments, your contributions. Um, I can imagine these conversations will take place throughout the rest of the conference, um, but I've been really pleased that you've been able to join us today to share this with us. Um, and thank you everyone for joining uh, what has been a great session. And we we'll invite you to, there's a mindfulness session that's starting shortly if you need some time. And uh, our next session starts at two o'clock. So thanks again to everyone.